up, Greg? What's up? Man. So you have one of the most effective platforms to teach people how to witness for Christ, right? Dare to share. Yeah. What, got, what caused you to get so passionate about sharing your faith and training others to share their faith? You know, when I was a kid, I was, I was raised in a very violent inner city home, and a lot of my uncles spent time in jail, a lot of violence. On Friday night, mom used to say, hey, you wanna watch cops? And we would follow the cop cars <laughs> to the scenes of the crime. And uh, sometimes they were at our house. And so, you know, broken family, never knew my biological father. And a preacher from the suburbs reached out to the city on a dare and reached the toughest one of my uncles with the gospel. And then they all just fell like dominoes. And I watched the utter transformation of my family through the power of the gospel. And so, as a kid, I was like, I gotta spend the rest of my life training others to share the goodness of Christ. And so that's, that's what I do. So, you know, I just really witnessed the power of the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And so I, I think so many times we, we underestimate the power of the gospel mm. to change our lives and to change communities, to change this nation, to change the world. You know, I was a one-night stand result of a short-term relationship. Never, never met my biological father. She drove from Denver to Boston to have an illegal abortion. It was before Roe v. Wade. My grandparents found out, and they said, hey, you come back and have that kid. We know you're pregnant. Come back and have that kid, and we'll help you raise him. And so I didn't know why oftentimes she would look at me and just start crying. My grandma told me years later, it's because she felt she felt guilty. Every time she saw you, she thought of that almost abortion. And um, I remember telling my mom the gospel, because this preacher had trained us all how to share Christ. And I told my mom the gospel from the time I was 11 or 12 to the time I was 15. And she would always say, I'm too sinful. I've done too many things wrong. I go, Mom, it doesn't matter. Jesus died on the cross. And I remember when I was 15, I sit down at the kitchen table. I go, Mom, I'm tired of it. you got to know Christ. She goes, you mean to tell me that Jesus died for me on the cross and paid the price for all my sins? I go, yeah, even the bad ones. They're all bad, Mom. She took a drag. She goes, I believe. She put her faith in Christ in that moment. And I'll never forget you know, it wasn't like instant perfection, but she had joy for the first time in the deepest part of her soul. She's doing great. So I just really, again, believe in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that everyone needs to experience and continue to experience it as believers. So the baby she almost kills leads her to Christ 15 years later. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, but yes, that's exactly what happened. So what do you think about when you think about men who don't take their responsibilities. I mean, you're one of the few yeah. awesome stories, but we hear so many tragedies from boys yeah. especially raised without their dads. You know, I actually have, I mean, I, 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 obviously I think it's horrible if men don't take their responsibility. I think it's terrible. I have a really special place in my heart for fatherless kids um, because I really believe that God's got a special place in his heart for the fatherless Psalm says he's a father to the fatherless. Mm -hmm. and, and really, you know what I think is even harder, harder than being fatherless? Is having a dad at home who's not really there. Mm. And to me, that's the worst kind of fatherlessness. You know, because he's physically present, but not emotionally present. And so I, I think we live in a generation of fatherless um, young men and women. I really do, and I feel terrible for them. That's why, again, I want to get the gospel to them. Uh, so they can have the hope of Christ. And to the dads, the deadbeat dads, I want to get the, after the beating, I want to give them the gospel. <laughs> but um, to, to give them the hope of Christ as well. Everybody needs to. Uh, so what do you do this. if you've got guys watching this yeah. who they screwed up? Yep. They weren't there for their kids. Their yep. kids maybe are grown, their kids are jacked up. They didn't do what they were supposed to. And they, like your mom, are saying, I I'm worthless. Yeah. I I'm guilty. I'm a horrible person. Is Jesus' grace good enough for those guys? Yeah. I mean, it's when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakbathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, Jesus bore the price for all of our sin. He, he suffered in our place on the cross for every sin, every sin. And then he said, it is finished. And that, that is actually, in the Greek, it's one word, tetelestai, which means paid in full. It's the same, the same stamp they would use when a bill was paid, paid in full. So the, the, the bill of our sin, whether it's, my mom's immorality, or whether it's a deadbeat dad, or whatever sin that may be, nailed to the cross, it is finished. But you must receive it by faith. You have to put your faith in Christ and say, I believe. And 
you, when you do that, you're for, not only forgiven, you're declared righteous. Righteous as Jesus himself. Not, not in, you know, I mean, not in real life, you don't automatically become righteous, but positionally, in Christ. And you're adopted into the family of God. And you're called a child of the king. And on and on and on and on. And it's all by his grace. So none of us deserve it. But we receive it simply through faith. So what do you do if you're a Christian? You receive Christ. You've got his grace. But you've been living like an unbeliever for a while. Yeah. You're laden down with your guilt. What do you do to get right with Christ? Come back to the cross. It's a decision away. It's already nailed to the cross. You come back. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous. And will forgive us our sins and, and cleanse us from all righteousness. That word confess literally means to say it is so. So it's just to recognize I've, I've messed up and and he cleanses from our sin and, and all of our sin and, and that relationship is restored. And the difference is when you're an unbeliever um, he's not your father he's a judge, right? Um, but I heard somebody say it like this, on the day we got saved, God turned a criminal proceeding into an adoption ceremony. Oh, that's good. So once we're saved uh, that that confession of sin and that restoration of relationship is not between a judge and a criminal. It's between a father and a son. The relationship's still there. It's just been clouded with sin. So just confess it and and move in the spirit. We're saved. We're children of the King. We struggle, uh, but we find grace in our Lord Jesus Christ to help us to continue to win the battle. What effect did that have on your marriage after that? You know, I just think it, it gave us a kind of the honesty to be able to share with others where, you know, when we were struggling. You know, I, I believe every every marriage is either a waltz or a tango. A waltz is, you know, they seem never to fight, dance beautifully. A tango is, you lead, no, I lead, no, kiss me, no, dance, you know, and so, you know, that we got a tango. And I think now we just own it. Like, I love it. You know, and I, I love my wife and I love us working through stuff and I love the honesty and vulnerability and we screw up a lot, but we find grace in our Lord Jesus Christ, just like the gospel. So as you guys are struggling, it wasn't a counselor, it wasn't a five-step program, it was a Holy Spirit just... It's a Holy Spirit headbutt. Man, what do you think that did to your ministry now? I mean, you look at the effect you're having. I mean, a million young people taught how to share their faith. Yeah. Whether they choose to take that teaching and do something yeah. with it, but heck, if a hundred of them yeah. did, what effect does it have on the kingdom? So you're having this amazing, I'm thinking about uh, Ronald Reagan's quote, um, many people go through their whole lives wondering if they ever made a difference. A, mar a Marine doesn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of Christians wonder when I get to heaven, will Jesus say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, you're not gonna have that problem. Uh, I, pray, I, I pray that's what I hear, you know. And the effect it had on me, the effect it had on me personally, um, I think we're very open and honest with teenagers about our struggles. I think teenagers are attracted to authenticity. I think adults are. I think men are, you know, mm -hmm. when we're honest about our struggles. And I think that helps them really take what you say seriously. Do you think there's too little of that in the church right now? I do. I think, uh, I think a lot of times we just kind of look like we got it all together. And I don't think the early church looked like that at all. I, you know... James 5 says, you know, pray, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. You know, the siren in the background reminds me of my family life growing up. Hold on while I just take it in. <laughs> I missed my mom. <laughs> but I think when, we're, when we confess our sins, you know, we confess our sins to God, somebody said, for forgiveness, we confess to each other to be healed. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. So one last question. There are some people who are watching this. We talked about the broken people, but what about the good people that, you know, they're nice Christians. They're good Christians. They yeah. go to church three out of four Sundays and every Easter, and um, they maybe go to a Bible study, but they're thinking, I want to get involved, but I don't know how. What do I do? Yeah. So I hear about these fatherless kids everywhere, but I live in the suburbs of wherever, yeah. and I don't see for the poor. I don't, I don't even know how. How do they actively get involved. How do they make sure that Jesus says, well done, good and faithful serve? Yeah, I think start with where you're at. I mean, obviously we want to reach out to the broken and the hurting around us, but start with your sphere of influence. And I ask you the question, have you shared your faith? Have you talked to your coworkers about Christ? Have you put skin in the game? Because it's easy to go to church on Sunday and sing uh, when you're in a room full of Christians, but when you share your faith, you're putting skin in the game because you're risking your social equity uh, with those that you love and respect because they could reject you. So 
I would say start praying for them, start looking for opportunities to share Christ, and then be be open to those who are hurting. Look for those who are hurting in a room. When you go into a room, look for the person that is hurting the most and go to them. That's exactly what Jesus did. So I think asking for Jesus' eyes um, to see people like he did. So I lied. I got one more question. Yeah. All right, so what about the guy who just heard that yeah. and says, yeah, but I don't look that great. I mean, I, I follow Christ, but I cuss sometimes, and I do this and I do that. And guys that see me, I, I don't really look any better than my coworkers. Yeah. So how do I share my faith? They're going to go, who, who are you? Yeah. What do you say to those guys? I would say this. Obviously, you want to work on those areas, right? But I think we got to realize it's really not about us. It's about the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, again, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The gospel is like a grenade. It doesn't matter who pulls the pin, it's going to explode. It doesn't matter if you're the godliest guy on the planet, or even Paul said in Philippians 1, some people are given the gospel out of selfish ambition, but they're given the gospel, and for that I rejoice. So don't let that hold you back. Let it motivate you to live a holy life, loving life, and proclaim the gospel of Christ. Awesome, man. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Good stuff.